For this lecture, we're going to discuss radiation therapy, and specifically, we're going to talk about both external beam radiation therapy and brachytherapy. I personally feel that radiation therapy is one of the most rewarding experiences um, that we have in that we truly have the ability to connect with our patients and provide um, sound care to improve their experience through what is classically a devastating disease and cancer. So you really get that, that you know, powerful connection piece and that you're seeing these individuals um, that have unique stories um, on a regular basis. And it, you know, it, may be, it may be a two week experience or it may be an eight week experience, but um, classically you're seeing these patients five days a week. So it really ha you really have the opportunity to um, have rapport building and really connect with um, individuals on a completely different level um, you become a, essentially their their cheerleader. You, you're you're there making a, a traumatic impact um, in um, essentially their perspectives, and you know to be able to provide that type of care, I think, is a powerful thing. While radiation therapy isn't used exclusively for cancer care, the bulk of the work that does take place in a radiation therapy center does involve treating individuals that do have cancer. Now, the process of diagnosis is complex. It does involve blood testing, imaging, biopsies, so this whole series of steps, multiple appointments, multiple visits. Um, and, but then you get to a point where that um, tumor can be staged. So we're not talking about is it ma ma benign or is it ma malignant, but you know where in the spectrum does it fall? Typically, most cancers are staged um, one through four, with four being um, the most devastating or typically the the lowest prognosis, meaning that it's metastasized from its home site to a different location. So um, there there's a whole series of um, steps that kind of determine the tr treatment approach, though. So of course, you know the site, so where where it's at. And then the stage are going to help to determine what that treatment approach is, but it's a whole multidisciplinary approach. So it may involve a pathologist, a radiologist, surgeons, oncologists, and those oncologists are, are subsetted too with you know medical oncology doing chemotherapy and radiation oncology, of course, doing radiation. But the whole team has to work together to accurately diagnose um, the patient, be able to provide a, a an appropriate prognosis, and finally be able to develop a treatment plan that's optimal for, for that patient and for the, that cancer. So there's all kinds of you know, teamwork that's involved, but also there, there's the emotional side of things and making sure that um, we're um, considering the psychological needs of the patient I think is imperative to be able to apply. So hooking those patients up with um, psychologists, with social workers, um, with dietitians. So there's a whole host of, um, a whole host of individuals that need to um, be involved. And once it's determined that radiation therapy is an appropriate um, approach for a given, um, the, a given tumor, it's not always you know, appropriate. Um, it may be used you know, before chemotherapy, after chemotherapy, with surgery, without surgery. Um, or it may not be used at all depending on the particular cancer. So, but once it's um, decided, typically you have either external beam or brachytherapy, and majority of, of times you are doing um, some form of external beam radiation therapy initially. So as far as the individual steps that are involved within that process, you can see um, a series of five steps here. So initially what's gonna happen is that the patient is going to be consulted. So um, I'll break down all of these steps in the, in the coming um, presentations, coming slides, but um, so these are the main ones though. So the patient com comes to the department, they undergo a consultation um, process, um, and then beyond that, so once they approve and are you know, properly informed, uh, the patient does go under, undergo something called simulation. So this is essentially um, a C, typically a CT scan. Um, and then fr from there, um, they can use that information to develop the treatment plan. Treatment um, then can follow that treatment plan. Um, and there, there may be several treatment plans that take place. But then after that, of course, there, there's follow up and just to make sure that the patient um, you know, is, is still in the, in, in the clear beyond the, those treatments. So uh, definitely um, define prescribed steps, but we will break down all each, each of these steps kind of in the coming slides. 
So then with external beam radiation therapy, typically it's going to use um, what's called a linear accelerator. So that's this big um, unit here. So that's going to be able to pr produce our beam. That beam may be um, utilize photons or electrons. Um, but you know there, there are other types of equipment that can be used um, in addition. But what's great if you've never been around a linear accelerator is that it moves um, essentially seamlessly. So you, you basically, you name that the movement and it, you probably can come up with, with a way to be able to move it in that orientation. So this move, moves 360 degrees around. Um, and then the collimator here also moves typically 360 degrees, so completely around. And then when you look at the couch here, um, the couch can move, of course, up and down, in and out, left and right. Um, but you also have the ability, it's kind of on a, on, a, on a platform, you have the ability to kick the couch so to be able to move this um, completely around as well. So those couch kicks allow for some unique um, treatments and unique um, kind of orientations to take place in order to um, best target um, that area of interest, that being typically the, um, you know, the, the tumor volume or the tumor bed. So there's a variety of different approaches that, that may be able to be used. Uh, 3D conformal is, is one approach, so, and typically you're using a CT scan to, to be able to do these two top approaches. Um, and really for, for all these, these approaches, you're using CT as kind of the base and then planning beyond that. But 3D conformal is one great way of establishing a treatment. Um, one a little bit more progressive way, though, is called IMRT. So, um, intensity modulated radiation therapy, extremely precise plan. There's a lot more, um, a lot more time and effort that's kind of put into the the treatment planning process. Um, but when you think about, you know, kind of, you know, what's going on in radiation therapy, and we'll get into the goals, but um, you're you're really t trying to target that tumor, and and while also trying to spare that healthy tissue. So, you know, how can we best do that? Will depend on the sites. Um, so, you know, some you know, particular um, sites may, you know, prefer, you know, 3D conformal. They may be the best mechanism for that particular tumor. Um, others may be IMRT. It just depend, kind of depends on the standard of care. Tomotherapy is a, it, it's um, still, it's, it's radiation therapy, but the process to get um, to that end is a little bit different. Essentially that unit, it looks like a CT scanner um, for, for the most part. So the orientation is different. Um, of course, you know, you think about a CT scanner and how it works, that um, tube still is going to move 360 degrees. Um, same type of thing happens in tomotherapy, except it's not using KV range, it's using um, MV range, so me mega voltage, so much higher voltage to be able to treat that tumor. So um, other um, more advanced types of treatments, um, stereotactic radiosurgery, stereotactic body radiation therapy as well, so SRS, SBRT. Um, are very progressive. Um, typically, SRS is used for um, brain um, tumors, extremely precise, a lot of planning, a lot of um, setup that goes into it. And um, SBRT is, is another great way at um, kind of increasing your, your precision and in, in your approach um, to treat um, kind of in, in, a, in a different way. And you can um, establish SBRT, um, of course, on, on linear accelerators as well. So again, to more clearly look at the um, intention behind radiation therapy is we're using what's called a therapeutic dose of ionizing radiation. Um, so we typically think of ionizing radiation as being something we want to limit, but when used um, and planned effectively, it can be something that can be very, very beneficial as well, of course. Um, but the whole idea is to be able to target that um, tumor. So hit, that, uh, hit, hit our target, hit our, whether that's a tumor or a tumor bed. Um, but while also subsequently managing and lessening the effects, um, if at all possible, of those healthy base tissues. So um, how you do that, you know, you, you, that's why we have so many moving parts, I guess, is that if you were to just completely go in one orientation, that's really going to damage that healthy tissue. But if you go through in multiple orientations and so multiple different directions, um, that's going to help to spare some of that healthy tissue. So the planning process is imperative to be able to make sure that you design a treatment plan that doesn't exceed the dose limits for any organ um, in that area of interest. So when we think of something like a prostate um, exam, you're thinking about um, sparing the bladder. You're, more specifically, you're thinking about sparing the rectum, um, femoral heads, uh, seminal vesicles. 
Um, so, you know, we, we try to keep, you know, you, you look at carefully at making sure that those um, healthy tissues um, are ma at a managed level of radiation exposure. So you have to be creative at times to make sure that you're not exceeding dose limits, um, depending on the, the nature of that plan. How you get to that point, though, you may use photons, you may use electrons. So you think about in traditional projection radiography where um, those um, electrons are generated from a cathode, they slam into an an the anode, and essentially they make um, those X-ray photons. A similar thing happens in radiation therapy, but the design is a little bit different. Um, so with the photon generation, so they're produced by what's called an electron gun. They're accelerated down. Um, and they use what's called a transmission target. So those electrons go through a transmission target, which is typically made of gold. And, um, and then from there, of course, they, they become you know, X-ray photons, but they're just at a very, very high range, so that mega voltage range. Electrons can also be used, so what takes place in that case is that the target is removed out of the, the beam's pathway. Um, and, in, and in place, it creates, you use something called a scattering foil. But um, what the electrons can be used for is more superficial lesions. So um, maybe a lumpectomy um, for, for, for a breast so to, to boost that tumor bed to make sure that we're getting um, you know, any residual area that needs treated that, that's being boosted. Um, same with mastectomy, um, skin um, lesions. So um, any type of skin cancer may use electrons as well. Um, photons, of course, are, are for more deep-seated um, types of lesions. So um, you can think of, you know, prostates or lungs or breasts. Um, you know, um, all would would typically use photons. So they have a more um, penetration. So the the depth of penetration is a little bit different. So when you look at these two pictures, um, this is um, typically going to be it's called a cone, uh, but it's it's used as an attachment. So it would fit into here. Um, it, and it's used to essentially to shape the, the beam field for an electron treatment. Um, and then for a photon-based treatment, all of these little leaves in here do move, um, and they, they may move from projection to projection, so it may not just be an open field, or they may move um, for one single, um, essentially one single area. They may continuously be moving, and that's kind of the definition of intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT is that these are continuously moving throughout the beam on time. So um, really a pretty cool approach, but these multi-leaf um, collimators are all located in the treatment head up here. So um, great uses, very precise, very different than some of the other modalities that have essentially um, stationary designs with the, the motion of the MLCs, multi-leaf collimators. So to now get into the individual steps, the first phase in radiation therapy, of course, is the consultation phase. So once it's determined that radiation therapy is appropriate for this particular patient, um, that patient will be re referred back to the radiation oncologist. And um, so they'll undergo essentially a um, conversation, but it also involves an informed consent process. Um, the radiation nurse may also um, be a part of this process. A radiation therapist may also be a part of this process. It really depends on the facility's particular um, design to the, the consultation process, but at minimum, the oncologist will be present. Um, complete patient history will be reviewed ahead of time, um, but during that process, an additional patient history may be taken, so the patient may be asked to fill out an intake form. Uh, essentially, you're, you're going to just make sure that um, you know, determine what um, types of medications that they're, the patient's on, you know, get um, um, contact-based information, you know, do they have a pacemaker, do they have any prosthesis, well, what surgeries have they had. Um, so it's just that, that general, you know, history-taking process. From there, the um, treatment rationale and those goals are going to be um, defined, so um, that risk-benefit balance is going to be um, elaborated on um, during this process. Um, the prescription will te tend to be mentioned or talked about, not in an overwhelming amount. So they're not going to say, you know, um, you know, 81 gray or 8100 centigrade are going to be used for this treatment over, you know, 45 fractions. But they may say that you're, you're going to be, you know, here for, you know, five days a week for eight weeks and we'll try to schedule a, a time that's convenient for you and works around your schedule. 
Um, so, you know, we, the, we try to be accommodating, um, but, you know, second opinions are also definitely very much welcomed. The best type of approach during the consultation process is one that involves some shared decision making. So it's not, this is what you need to do, but it's, this is what this procedure is all about. How do you feel about it? What questions do you have? And really trying to in, improve that patient-centered care and patient-centered experience. Side effects will be um, emphasized, educational information will be provided, and it just definitely the, this process is typically is an, a very overwhelming experience, and you know you have to question information processing then, um, since it is so overwhelming. So you know beyond consultation, the job of the radiation therapist really is um, one of of being an educator as well, and. Um, being it there to answer answer patients' questions and be able to watch for those side effects that may happen, but um, each person's desire for information will differ. So it is very very important that during this consultation that um, the approach is extremely individualized. The final kind of aspect is that treatment simulation will be also explained so they, they know uh, kind of the, those next steps. So typically, once you go through the informed consent process, that's what will be mentioned after that. While every step in the process of radiation therapy is extremely important, I personally think that treatment simulation perhaps is the most important. It, number one, it's the patient's first experience, so it's going to set the tone for the rest of that treatment experience. Um, but it's also this um, process of simulation, and essentially they're, they're going to go through a CT scan majority of the time, um, is the foundation for all other things. So this process is so very important to get right because this is what's going to ter determine how that treatment is planned. It's then going to determine how that treatment is delivered. So it, it's very important that the, the patient is in a position that is reproducible. That's the most important thing is that it has to be reproducible. So um, with these scans and a lot of facilities do have um, dedicated units, some may not, just kind of depends on um, the structure of that facility, but um, most, a lot of facilities do have dedicated CT simulators and um, with that, what's great about it is that the table is identical to that of the treatment table, which is great for reproducibility. So one big thing, one big difference about a CT simulator and a regular CT scan is that couch or that table in that you use a flat tabletop for a CT simulator and um, a regular traditional CT scan of course has that um, concave type of design to it. So um, it is important to, to make sure that you match things so that flat tabletop is absolutely required. But this is the point where immobilization is going to be um, set up. Depending on the location of um, the tumor will depend on the approach to immobilization. So you, in this case you can see um, that this patient does have a mask on, um, and this mask is, and we'll, we'll get we'll get into it kind of as as we go forward. But typically, it's um, it's flat um, initially, and then it's um, heated up, um, essentially in some um, basically like a skillet type of type of thing. So it it becomes warm and pliable, pressed over the patient's face, and it basically creates a very um, kind of a I don't want to say confined, but it really it, it, that that's the purpose is that it locks the the patients um, into a particular reproducible setup. That way, every time the treatment is delivered, their head's in the exact same position. Um, but you know, if if you're treated for a prostate, of course, you're not going to get you know a mask. If you're treated for a lung, you're not going to typically get a mask. So, you know, that um, approach to immobilization will differ um, widely depending on. Um, the site that needs to be treated, and, and even then, it's going to be individualized um, per the patient and their condition. Um, the most important thing, really, is to keep in mind that um, whatever position you put the patient in is that you have to remember to, for them to be able to still fit into um, the CT simulator bore. So sometimes you have to be a little bit creative um, to make sure that they um, are reproducible, but also can fit into that opening there. But um, different types of devices may be used, belly boards may be used um, to keep them prone, it gets the small bowel out of the way. Um, I call these aquaplasts, they do, the name of them um, does vary depending on the vendor, vac locks or, or vacuum um, bags may be used. Um, 
for, to support under the body that widely used for lungs and breasts. Um, you can also use them under the legs for like a prostate based treatment. Um, straws, gauze, head holders, um, specific arm positions, number of pillows, all of these things have to be documented. So um, documentation and taking of photographs to um, further document things are important. So you'll, you'll take photographs on both sides um, of that patient to kind of describe to anyone the exact position of that patient. But um, you'll, you'll document that their arms are, acro are across their, their abdomen, they're holding a ring, um, and, and so on and so forth. You document as much as you can. Um, there'll be a specific head holder cup that's under the under the patient. Um, so what, whatever you can document, the better, um, because it assures a reproducible setup. And ultimately, in radiation therapy, reproducibility is is the most important thing. Um, tattoos may also be um, given to the patient, and this is designed to make sure that um, you, you can kind of see some lasers in here, but. Um, there's lots of lasers involved with, with radiation therapy for the, the whole purpose of um, aligning the patient. So where those lasers fall, there may be um, some small like pen-sized tattoos that um, the C CT um, simulation therapist or technologist um, may give the, give the patient. So for this particular um, treatment, you can see where those lasers would um, correspond with. And let me zoom in here would correspond with um, these marks here. So um, in terms of setup, here's the up, down, here's the left, right, um, and you, you can't see it, but so you would manipulate the patient accordingly once it's time for treatment to make sure that they're aligned and they're aligned. Um, and you can see that the marks kind of up and down to just make sure that the patient's um, head is in a, a reproducible position. So. Um, typically during simulation, once it's complete, appointment schedules will be also generated. So some more approaches to simulation, so as promised, so you can see here's that, that flat area and that would just be heated up. Um, and it will be a little bit warm when you, when you push it over the, um, the patient, but essentially this is what it's going to be molded down to. Um, and then it'll harden up um, per the, you know, the, pa the patient's um, features and then uh, create, like I said, a nice reproducible um, fit. Um, here's a vac lock or vacuum based bag. So essentially it's a bean bag that has the, the air all sucked out. So you'll, you'll get the patient into a position um, and then um, suck the air out. Produces a nice reproducible um, design. So you know exactly where the, where the neck fits, you know exactly where the arms fit. And like I said, documentation is absolutely important. And you can see kind of how it, it keeps that um, form um, for, for each individual treatment. And then you can see what a CT simulator will look like. So the most important thing is it does have that flat tabletop. So now once that patient is immobilized um, effectively, they are um, scans in the CT scanner. And those images that, that were acquired during that uh, simulation phase are then used to do the treatment planning. The software involved, um, there, there's going to be specific treatment planning software. Um, vendors will, will differ depending on facilities. but. Um, there, there can be some turnaround, turnaround time demands. Um, typically, uh, you know, at least from from my past experience, um, about you're, you're given about a week to turn around um, that treatment plan. Um, so depending on on the patient and their needs, um, you know, it may, it may the timeline may be different. You know, some some patients are are planned and delivered their treatment on the same day. So. Um, those turnaround times definitely do differ. Um, contouring is something that I'll, I'll show you some examples of, but um, I, I love to contour. Essentially, it, it's it's like utilizing um, paint, a paint-based tool. So um, you're you're digitally drawing in all of the organs. So um, we'll say we'll go back to that prostate example. So you would draw in um, the the prostate, or um, the oncologist may draw in the prostate if that's the area of interest. It depends on again the facility, but typically the radiation oncologist will do the tumor um, itself or tumor bed. Um, but then um, the dosimetrist, medical dosimetrist, um, will essentially contour in all of the other structures, so bladder, rectum, um, um, femoral heads. Uh, seminal vesicle. So basically anything that um, is going to be in the area of interest needs to be documented because we need to see how much dose those structures get as well. So without proper contouring, there's no way to know how much dose um, a particular structure is getting. So contouring is um, of utmost importance, but as is um, the appropriate drawing of that tumor volume. And um, there, there's margins that are, that are given to that tumor volume to make sure, you know, for um, 
you know, just because we're trying our best to do reproducible setups, we do give ourselves some margins just in case some small subtle errors, um, you know, can take place. Um, so to make sure that we still are um, in line and making sure that um, our coverage is sound and that we're actually um, on target day in and day out. But um, use a dose volume histogram to make sure, we call that a DVH, just to make sure um, that coverage is um, effective to the tumor site, but also you're looking at the percentage um, of dose or exposure to those healthy tissues to make sure that we're minimizing the ter deterministic based effects. Um, so other, th other types of things is, you know, the, the approach is, is going to vary based on oncologist preference based on um, standard protocols based on the particular site um, but so you may use like a 3d approach an imrt approach a tangent approach parallel opposed fields four field box there's all kinds of different types of, of treatment approaches you can use um, but it, it does depend on a variety of factors so then from there what what becomes fun so the oncologist is they're gonna they're gonna look at um, the, the contours and then they're going to give you a, um, once the contours are determined appropriate, they'll give you a prescription. And that prescription is essentially is what the patient's dose, dose is supposed to be. Um, and then it'll break down of about how many, um, how much they're going to get in a daily dose and how much their, their total dose is, is going to be. So a total number of fractions. Um, a total energy um, may be something that, that is provided or it may be something that's selected dep depending on dosimetrist um, choice and again facility preferences. But the whole idea is, is that once you have this prescription that the oncologist gets you, it's, it's the dosimetrist job to be able to determine how to get that dose to that prostate while also sparing as, as much of the healthy tissues as possible. So. Um, we have to think about the side effects. We have to minimize deterministic effects. And um, multi, those multi-leaf collimators or those um, collimators that move um, are, are extremely important. Now, depending on the, on the site or the, of the area, you may do something called image fusion. Um, An image fusion looks like this. Essentially, it, it's the combination of multiple modalities. So we'll say that this is the CT scan from um, CT simulation. And this is a um, PET scan. And then essentially these two data sets are overlaid and it shows you particular areas. So you can see these hot spots here, particular areas that um, may need targeted. So um, it gives you the opportunity to design a really precise treatment. So depending on, uh, again, the area, um, you may use um, kind of um, kind of co-registration of, of images. So CT and MR images may be overlaid. And the most important thing, or the most difficult thing, I guess, is to align the patients or to match the, match the data sets because they may be in slightly different positions. So um, nonetheless, it's, it's a great process. Um, once you develop the plan, it is formally approved by the radiation oncologist. It's then verified um, through some um, dose calculation based software um, and then quality control um, does take place to make sure that what your planned output is actually um, matches the output um, that's um, being delivered on the um, treatment unit. So this is just a, an example of some things that do go into that prescription. So um, it, the modality is first, so are you going to use electrons or photons? Majority of the time you are using photons. Um, photons do come in a variety of different energies, um, so this is something that you know is is going to be you know set up in the in the treatment plan, um, verified on the treatment console. Um, so you can typically typical energies six, ten, or eighteen. Um, they're going to they're going to differ. Um, they may be a little bit higher. You may have some random ones in there, um, but those are classic ones. And then electrons um, do have a variety of different energies as well. So typically higher energy, so we'll say 18X or 18MV, um, is um, going to be used, um, gets, gets you a little bit um, deeper um, deeper dose. So again, it depends on, on the site. Same type of idea is applied here. So um, you know, deeper um, dose maximum, dose depth um, takes place for the higher energies. Technique, um, tangents, IMRT um, will be indicated. So tangents um, are used for breasts, IMRTs are used for lots of different things. But um, further in the prescription, it says the number of fractions. Fractions are how many times the patient comes. So 45 fractions is not un an uncommon number. The patient still comes five days a week. 
Um, so, you, you know, you, you get the sense that, hey, that's nine weeks of, of treatments. It's not unheard of, but um, it's very actually very, very common. Um, now, fra the fraction dose is how much dose they're getting per day, 180 centigrade. Um, per day, so they are getting a large percentage, um, and 180 is a, is a typical number. Uh, 200 um, centigrade per day would be a typical number as well, um, and then total dose so um, is tracked. So they may have one treatment plan that goes all the way through um, their course of treatment, or they may have um, kind of like boosting of treatment plans as well. So you can kind of see some examples here of um, some treatment plans. Um, a little bit, probably a little bit blurry on, on your end because it's a little bit blurry on my end. Um, but you can see the different orientations of the beams here. So you can just actually count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine beam approach, um, which is, you know, fa fairly common. Um, and you, then you, you can see kind of, um, it's, actually it's very difficult to see on, on this particular image, but you can kind of see the dose fluencies or the dose patterns. And um, so those doses, um, basically it'll say, you know, how much dose is, is, is being given to, the, to those different sites. And, and you can kind of basically see the, the dose lines there. Um, but the, then the volume is all indicated here. So just based on this particular line, that straight line there, um, that would indicate, you know, pretty solid coverage over the tumor itself. Just, you know, classically just knowing how to look at these things, that's what that line is indicating. And then these are just different structures and you want to be able to see that quick fall off um, over here as well. So just another example of um, kind of that, that beam's eye approach. So this is an example of a breast-based treatment. So um, what, what's crazy is, is that the system does give you, you know, the skin, the skin rendering, so you can see, um, you know, kind of that, that patient there. Um, but it's called a tangent approach used for breast treat, treatment. So typically there's a nice straight line that's oriented at the, at the bottom. And then um, there's some flash that goes over, over, the, over the top to assure that um, that the breast is being fully treated. So um, when you have breast cancer, um, you know, the, the typical protocol, typical approach is that you're going to you know, treat the entire breast um, that was affected. So the other approach is that you have to think about the heart, you have to think about the lungs, so you have to think about the contralateral breast, you have to, you know, turn the patient's head, you want to get this arm out of the way. So there's a lot of things that go into that initial simulation and making sure that, yes, you produce a reproducible setup that's also can be um, used effectively for the treatment planning process. And, you know, what the, the true technique is, is going to look like, um, like I said, it'll, it'll differ based on facility and oncologist preference. It'll differ based on protocol, um, that tumor, the stage of that tumor, um, and, and that location of that tumor. So just another example of what contouring actually looks like. So you can see um, a, an example of a CT slice here of the, um, the prostate area. So you can see where B is the indicating of the prostate. So you would actually draw in that prostate. A is the bladder. So you don't just draw it in on, on one, one slice, but you draw it in on the complete data set. And you can interpolate between slices. Um, but for the most part, you're, you're drawing it, those um, structures in. So you can see the bladder, you can see the rectum. And then the other thing that um, classically is also drawn in is the femoral heads as well. So you can see those, and you can see the greater trochanters here also. And then you can kind of see kind of, you know, beyond that, yes, again, it's blurry. It's just the kind of the, the pixelated nature of, of this particular image. But kind of, you know, every slice does have um, some in individual um, contours on them. And you can see that the, the um, femoral heads are drawn in as well. So in separate colors for separate structures. So you can see that um, the left and right femoral heads are being tracked separately. So you know exactly what dose is going to what structure. Just a little bit, another um, little view about, uh, you know, the treatment planning process. When the process is being planned out, you, uh, you, you do look at the body and in, in simultaneously in multiple different orientations. So um, you, you can see the coronal, sagittal, and axial orientations are all being looked at. You're, and that way you can um, see what type of dose coverage you're getting to the tumor, um, wh which is ultimately most important. You, you, you need to target the tumor, um, get as much dose to that tumor as possible while sparing those healthy tissues or keeping those healthy tissues at a manageable dose. And then you can see another um, orientation. So this is an example of a, a breast setup here. 
Um, so again, it's using tangents. So um, basically, essentially, they're, they're almost like parallel opposed fields, um, with the exception that there is a nice straight line here. So you can see the whole breast is being treated in this case. Contralateral breast needs to be avoided um, as much as possible. But you also have to have to look at the, the nodes, so the lymph nodes, to make sure that they're in the treatment field. So lots of considerations um, to make, but then you can also see that um, you always allow the beam to extend beyond um, the skin just to make sure that um, you, you, just to uh, make sure that um, complete coverage is taking place. So kind of get a sense of, of what the traditional breast-based setup looks like. You can see it here. Um, on the rendering, um, you, you can see the, each of the individual treatment fields as well. Um, so you know they're, they're sparing as much of the lung as possible while also treating um, that breast effectively. We call isodose lines essentially it's the dose fluencing, um, the dose mapping. Um, so you can see a variety of different um, areas. So each of these lines can be adjusted and, and, and looked at from, from different ranges. Um, so you can look at you know, maybe the 50% the line, the 60% you know, line, the 80% line, et cetera. So you can kind of see your, your coverage. Um, so ideally, the 100% line will be completely encompassing the, the, um, the complete tumor itself. And then, you, but you also can see based on the orientations where um, other dose is being deposited. So you look at the spinal cord in, in this case, and spinal cord, of course, you know, is radiosensitive um, structure is something that you care deeply about. You don't wanna um, um, essentially initiate any paralysis. So it's something that, that's carefully planned around, but salivary glands are also um, planned around as well. So, but, so you can see kind of the, the general pattern here um, of, of the dose deposit. So again, you wanna get nice coverage over the tumor while also sparing some of that healthy tissue and some of those radiosensitive areas. So once the treatment plan has been reviewed and accepted by the oncologist, it then um, you know you undergo um, that quality control based testing just to make sure that everything is acceptable and everything is planned as as it, as it should be. Um, then you're ready ready for that that patient's first treatment. Um, and the first in treatment is very, very important to just establish that ground level rapport. Um, helps really to um, ease the patient's anxiety, make the patient feel more comfortable. So good communication um, is key. Expectations should be well con conveyed, well explained. Um, and one effective tool to do this is just having you know, a, a you know, 10, 10 minute chat before that first, um, that first treatment, just to make sure the patient kind of knows what to expect, you're able to answer any, any questions, but um, active listening is uh, really important. Just make sure that we're, we're hearing the patient, we're responding to their needs, um, we're doing what we can for them. Um, so, you know, from the, this point on, um, you know, in terms of what the radiation therapist is going to be doing is, um, you know, yes, they're, they're going to be kind of a, a part of that success team, that success coach, you know, offering the patient um, support and advice. Um, while also making sure that they are carrying out um, the treatment plan and um, the setup that was determined by the simulation. So setup is key um, and final checks are going to typically be done. So some initial first day imaging is typically going to take place just to make sure that setup accuracy does match. So uh, digitally reconstructed radiographs or DRRs are going to match the images that are required or cone beam CTs. Um, may be used to make sure that the soft tissue margins actually are in alignment. Um, so you just have to have a lot of accuracy in planning because margins typically can be pretty tight around those um, tumor beds or, or um, tumor volumes. So you, you have to make sure that um, they're in a reproducible setup every day and um, they're, they're getting what they need. So individual communications, of course, will be individualized. Each person's needs are going to differ, but it's, you know, that's part of the, you know, experience for that patient is to make sure that they understand the expectations um, and that you're helping them and guiding them um, through this process. So you can see just a little bit more of inside the uh, linear accelerator. So like I said, initially a lot of moving parts um, go into it. Um, and what's really cool is that you, you have controls in multiple different areas. So you can control a lot of things here on the couch, and but you can control just about everything um, on the pendant itself. So be able to manipulate essentially the, the complete unit. But gives you a little inside inside scoop on, on how the um, uh, 
linear accelerator um, looks and you can see what, what we call as, as being the gantry device. So the gantry does move, the collimator does move, the couch does move. And um, this particular um, structure is just like a portal vision or an EPID. So it's just basically used to, to capture the, um, the initial um, images to verify setup accuracy. So while all of that setup is going on and you're getting the patient all positions, um, the patient is monitored um, from start to finish. Um, so you do have um, typically um, at least two cameras. This one in particular um, area has multiple cameras, but at least two cameras um, in the treatment room itself um, just to make sure that the patient isn't moving um, because obviously you need to stop the treatment if the patient moves because precision, accuracy are key. Um, so monitoring that patient continuously is key as well, but you're also doing checks um, of your systems um, before you initiate um, any beam um, just to make sure that um, everything is matching that the patient's treatment is, the, the treatment that's being delivered is um, the one that was planned to be delivered for them. So a lot of tracking um, goes into this. Um, now it's all electronic. Um, but uh, there's a lot of verif verifications and steps that, that can't be overlooked. So you have to still manually make sure that, hey, something isn't um, input in, in the computer wrong, creating you know, a systematic error, um, but, but that you're, you're actually you know, effectively evaluating that everything is correct day in and day out and you're monitoring the situation. Beyond that, so the, and for each subsequent um, you know, treatment, um, there's going to be um, continued um, accuracy that's going to have to be verified, so that may be um, continuous images. Some, um, some locations may require um, imaging daily, others may require imaging weekly. Just kind of depends on um, facilities protocols, but also kind of how reproducible the, the patient setup is. So. You have to verify your distances, so watch um, you know, how far away the source to the skin distance is, you know, making sure everything is matching. Um, because if, if it's not, yes, it could be indicative of some weight loss taking place for that patient, but it also could be indicative of some incorrect positioning. So um, it's an, important to make sure you monitor those distances, but radiation therapists also are charged with making sure that you're monitoring those side effects. You're, you're observing, uh, so not only are you you know, establishing that rapport with that patient to get them through the experience, but you're also, um, you know, making seeing um, what effects um, may be may be taking place um, in terms of um, what's taking place to the skin. So some observable base effects, but also you know, speaking with your patient and um, seeing what's um, what may be happening internally, how they're actually um, feeling. But providing information, I think, is is really important to just make make sure the patient uh, keeps that feeling of. Um, autonomy and control, so um, that that, we, that way they can, um, you know, feel feel like you know they're they're part of the experience. The experience just isn't happening to them, type of thing. Beyond that, um, aside from the kind of the role of the radiation therapist, is typically um, patients will meet with a nurse um, weekly, and they'll they'll meet so radiation um, radiation oncology nurse, and then they'll also meet with the radiation oncologist, typically on a weekly basis as well. So those treatment-based side effects, they do have kind of a, a latent period. So they typically do, do not um, appear for about two to three weeks, um, you know, in, into the course of the uh, of that treatment. But they continue to um, progress even after the treatment. So you can kind of think of it, you know, as being a little bit of a lag time. So those um, those um, treatment-based side effects, you know, may may be worse actually, you know, two to two weeks or so after after the treatment. Um, you know, it has concluded. So it's important just to make sure that the patient is aware of that um, and that, you know, they, they know what to do, who to call, um, if anything, um, you know, were to happen. But one, one big um, thing to note is that feelings of withdrawal are very, very common. So you're with, with the patient um, and you, they're not just with you, but they're with a whole host of individuals. And then abruptly, you know, treatment ends and, you know, contact ends. So uh, I think it's it's important to continue to um, you know follow up with with patients on, on a regular basis and follow up um, traditionally differs depending on site depending on um, location but you know six weeks post treatment um, you know is is a common interval um, for for seeing that patient and then that the patient continues to be seen 
at regular intervals, um, you know, up to that you know five-year remission point. Now, for the second portion of this lecture, we're going to um, now focus on brachytherapy, which is a different approach than external beam radiation therapy. Some individuals call it brachytherapy. I tend to call it brachytherapy, but um, what this approach is is when a sealed radioactive source is placed either into or near a, a tumor bed uh, or the tumor um, directly. So typical sites that this could be used for um, are indicated here. So gynecological, prostate, breast, lung, um, esophagus. Um, the approaches, they may be um, utilize these sources on a temporary basis or they may um, leave them in on a permanent basis. So um, prostates, typically you're gonna use um, some seeds that look like this, so little pellets um, that are very, very small. Um, you know, they're, they're more like about, mm, about that big, I would say, um, depending on, of course, on the size of your monitor, but at least on my end, they're, they're you know, relatively small, um, but they are left in permanently and um, they can be used with external beam radiation therapy or without it. It's going to depend on the site. It's going to depend on the stage. It's going to depend on the, um, the volume of the, that organ, um, whether this approach can be used um, without external beam. But um, it's, a, it's a great option to um, continue to boost the dose to the tumor while also sparing that healthy tissue. Now the, the approach does have specific names or specific types. So you, you can see um, intracavitary, um, interstitial, intraluminary, or, or surface-based molds um, can be used in some, essentially some um, locations that um, these areas may be um, utilized in. So intracavitary, so in a body cavity, um, maybe um, a vaginal-based um, treatment, maybe an, a uterine-based treatment. So um, cervical, um, cervical cancers, um, that type of thing. Um, interstitial is placed um, directly into a tissue, so breast or prostate. Intraluminal placed into a lumen. So um, two that are mentioned here are esophagus and um, the bronchi or um, the bronchus of the lungs. But they, it, it, you also can do radiation therapy in vessels and veins as well, so that's something else to kind of note. Um, surface molds um, can be used for um, eyes or skins um, as well. So you can see um, this is an example of an intracavitary um, applicator here up top and then this is um, an example of an interstitial applicator here. So um, essentially what happens is um, you know with, with this particular approach is that these needles are placed into um, the patient. They are quite long obviously um, to, to make sure that you can get it into the tumor uh, but then the, the source itself um, will be hooked up here and then inserted in, dropped into its place. There are also different dose rates that are associated with brachytherapy, um, LDR, um, MDR, and HDR, um, different forms. So um, kind of the breakdown here does indicate the specific dose rates. So 0 0.5 to 1 gray per hour as low dose. And you think, oh my gosh, that sounds so high, which in comparison to other modalities is extremely high. Um, but high dose rate may be as great as 12 gray per hour. So, you know, how long the source is left in there um, will vary. Typically HDRs are, are temporary. Um, LDRs may be a little bit more permanent um, types of um, brachytherapy approaches. This particular um, information does give you a little bit of breakdown as far as um, what, um, what materials may be used. So palladium-103, iodine-125, cesium-131, gold-198 um, are, are permanent sources. So they're, they're left in the, in the body, so they may be used to treat prostates. Uh, but there are some common temporary inserted um, seeds or sources, um, iridium-192, um, cesium-137, they may be used um, for these areas. So uh, for breast, head and neck, gynecological, sarcomas, so all kinds of different things may use um, different radioactive materials. And um, what's, what's used um, will vary. It, just, it depends on, you know, half-lives and dose rates um, and, you know, what's actually um, safe and effective for that particular um, tumor. So some general advantages of brachytherapy is that it has that high intensity. It does follow the inverse square law, of course, with radioactive material. So 
um, big dose um, close to it, and then as, as you get further away from essentially that, we'll say that radioactive seed, the dose does um, you know die down. So it has the ability to greatly maximize the dose to a tumor while minimizing that dose to the healthy tissue. So really effective um, type of approach to be able to utilize. Um, and, and really it is great if an organ does have a lot of motion um, because it, it's going to eliminate any inaccuracies that take place. You're going to get that radioactive source exactly where it needs to go and um, you'll be able to see the dose, um, dose coverage um, as well. So a really, really great um, opportunity to be able to um, spare that healthy tissue. Of course, it does require a lot of teamwork across multiple different disciplines. So. I'm going to stick with the idea of a prostate, so um, a urologist will, will be involved. Of course, on, on the day of the, the treatment, you'll have an anesthesiologist um, involved, radiation physicist, medical dosimetrist. Um, you're going to have, of course, your, your nursing team um, there as well. So, um, you know, just like in any surgery that requires a variety of um, team members, this type of approach also requires um, a variety of, of disciplines and individuals. It's an invasive procedure. Um, and you know, a lo large amount of times, um, at least for um, prostates, it may be um, done under anesthesia. It typically helps out that process. Pain meds may also be um, provided just depending on you know, the type of approach. So is it a gynecological one? A gynecological brachytherapy case, you know, they may not be under anesthesia. Pain meds may be um, the most effective approach, but um, they could be under anesthesia. It just depends on um, the nature of the procedure, how often um, they're going to have that procedure, um, and what's the expected time length of it. But there's a lot of imaging needs um, that are also associated with it. So sonography and fluoroscopy would probably be two of the most common imaging needs that are um, utilized um, in combination with brachytherapy just to guide um, to make sure that um, the, the um, radioactive materials are being um, inserted in, in, into the appropriate um, areas. So 30 minutes to two plus hours, but um, an individual may have a single treatment, they may have multiple treatment. So you get a good sense of kind of what a, a prostate treatment would look like. So um, with this, like, I, the patient, it does um, undergo anesthesia um, and, you know, probably for good reasons. There's a lot of needles that, that are being um, inserted. But um, so the patient's um, legs would be placed in his syrups. Um, and then you can see, of course, the, the location of that prostate um, here. But then you're also utilizing um, a transducer. So ultrasound probe um, essentially is going to guide um, uh, guide um, the, the location so you're going to be able to see um, the prostate itself um, and what you're going to be able to do is with the, um, the treatment planning software it's going to produce a, a grid um, and you can see this is uh, for lack of better words this is like battleship so you can see it's it's labeled with um, letters down low it'll be labeled with numbers so it, that tells you where the needle should be inserted can see the urethra of course you want to try to um, spare the urethra as well you don't want to give too high of a dose to the urethra so typically um, a lot of a lot of brachytherapy treatments are around the periphery of the of that prostate so um, each view is, is going to show you um, kind of different locations but um, use something called a mic applicator um, so those needles would be inserted through the peritoneum and um, go into um, the prostate itself the mic applicator would then um, be connected to push that seed in um, and then you subsequently can see the locations of these seeds uh, so here in the prostate so you know if you're in radiography if you ever see these exams now you know what what that is if you're in CT if you ever see this um, study now you know a little bit more about what it is um, so it's just called again brachytherapy um, and you can see how it's going around the prostate in this case so treating the whole prostate is um, the, essentially the goal while also sparing, um, largely sparing the rectum. So that's, that's really the, uh, a key factor um, in prostate treatments is to make sure that the, the rectum isn't getting um, too much dose. This further kind of breaks it down so you can really see kind of the, the approach here. Now I don't want to gross anybody out too much, but um, you can kind of see um, where that transducer is. You can see the grid um, here. Um, you can see a MIC applicator and you can see the needles. And then subsequently, these, these may be planned live. Um, we used to do them, 
you can either pre-plan it or you can do it live. We used to do it live um, most often. Sometimes it was pre-planned, but um, you can essentially see what that dose coverage would look like um, for this particular area. So really good coverage. And then subsequently, you can see multiple views of what that, um, what the grid and what the what the applicators actually look like um, for this process. Then I wanted you to have um, a look at some temporary based procedures as well. Um, so this is um, some gynecological uh, based brachytherapy treatments, um, and you can see what you use. Um, typically, you use something called a tandem with an ovoid or a tandem with a ring, so it may be utilized for cervical cancer. Um, and so what happens is that this device is inserted. So you can see um, that where that would be. Here's the, uh, of course, the the vaginal canal. Um, here would be the cervix itself, of course, here's the uterus, um, and then you can see the, the location of that applicator. Um, so not a comfortable procedure for, for that, um, the female patient by, by any means, but um, typically the, the patient is um, you know, given, given quite a few pain meds, but oftentimes they are awake during these procedures, but um, essentially you're trying to create this nice pear shape of dose pattern. Um, so um, what happens is that you're using what's called an um, afterloader, an HDR afterloader, so it has a very radioactive source, typically um, a iridium-based source um, is going gonna, is gonna to be used. And um, essentially it, it's fed in um, to the, the appropriate location um, for a given, you know, in a given dwell um, and it's um, kept, kept in that um, particular area for a specific amount of time. Um, and um, once that time has exceeded, it moves um, perhaps to a different dwell location um, to be able to make sure that the coverage is acceptable. And so you get a different idea of um, what this afterloader actually looks like. So you can see how many channels there are here. Um, so this one has quite a few different channels, so I'd imagine that that's probably maybe a breast um, treatment. Uh, but this one maybe, we'll say, um, is an OBGYN or GYN-based um, treatment. So you can see what that looks like, dose patterns. So um, of course, like based on the inverse square law, dose will be highest nearest to the source. and. Um, so you can see kind of what this looks like in a nutshell for some temporary brachytherapy based treatments. So all in all, that's radiation therapy, two different types. So external beam radiation therapy and um, brachytherapy. So really important modality um, as part of the cancer care spectrum. It's not the only one used, of course, you know, chemotherapy. Um, uh, hormone therapy um, can also be utilized, surgery can also be utilized, and, and the approach will differ depending on the stage and location um, of that particular cancer, but radiation therapists um, do perform a very, very important role in the cancer care um, spectrum, and it's just, uh, it's different than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is very, is a systemic-based treatment. Radiation therapy is a local-based treatment, so um, you know where the, those effects take place would all be local in relationship to where the um, the tumor is tumor is located and um, essentially the the pathway of that beam. So if you have any questions, be sure to let me know.